Houston, where we run it every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is all different areas of wellness, not just fitness, not just nutrition, but truly looking at that mind, body, soul, business, and of course, our story. What does our story have to do with our business? What does our story have to do with our wellness? <clears throat> what about our story? <clears throat> now, the reason why I say it like this is, I'm going to start off with my story and why this is a, a big conversation for myself. And again, please feel free to come up onto the stage if you would like to share. Uh, or, or you know me, I love to talk. So this is, uh, this is my gem. This is my thing to do. And I appreciate each and every one of you all for tuning in. It is a pleasure. It is an honor because if you all were not tuning in, I'd still be talking because my talking is my superpower. Even if I have to go, <clears throat> let me clear my throat. Um, it is still my superpower and the way how I see it is any opportunity for me to use it, whether there's a space of many or a space of none, I'm going to use it. And that's my form of wellness. Now, why am I going to be talking about story is your glory? Yes, we hear it all the time, but we should be, again, saying our story so that our listener could resonate with us. Or even if we're writing up that book, we want that reader to get something from it. And the best way that we could get do that is by having some form of relation or even painting a picture of an event so that they could visualize. So, you know, we think in shapes and pictures, not in writings, right? So it allows us to really paint a picture on that story. But now let's talk about my story and why I say, but I love hearing about people's stories. I love hearing about the tragedy, the triumphs, you know, those victory one where we, we, you know, the, where we have persevered, we made it. Yes. I love those ones so very much. You know, people that have went from living in a car and now are six figures or someone who is God bless has survived cancer or any form of other ailment. And they're here today to speak their story and show that they're thriving and striving. I love those. I love hearing about our war vets who put their life on the line for the country that they absolutely love and for the economy that they know that their family is going to live in because of their sacrifice for freedom. I love those stories. I do. And of the people that have went through so much tragedy and traumas as a children, because you know what? It does inspire me to see that anything is possible. If they can do it, I could do it too. Yes, I am motivated from it. But there goes that but again. For me now, <clears throat> that also I also get very intimidated by these stories. Now, why did I, let me rephrase that. I used to get intimidated by these stories. Now, why do you ask that I get intimidated by these tragedy to triumph stories? Because they are fantastic and we must have them because we need to have that hope, especially in the eyes and the light of, of the people that are currently going through those situations and circumstances. But for myself, it made me feel guilty. It made me feel guilty at the fact that, thank God, I have never had any form of ailment such as cancer or diabetes. Thank God, I have two loving parents, even though their marriage didn't work. They were, I, I'm a parent child. I, was, I can never say I was raised by just my mom or just my dad. I had both my parents. Were that, were, with them together, was it the best? Absolutely not. I remember at 15 sitting my, my parents down saying, parents, thank you for trying to get back together for me, but let's call it quits because you're actually causing me more damage being together. Yeah, I had that conversation with them, but you know what? I was able to have these conversations because of the relationships I have with them. I also have been raised in a beautiful country of Canada where I've had the opportunities as being the first generation Trinidadian Canadian of my family to be here and born and blessed to take advantage of the opportunities here. Those are all wonderful. I'm so grateful for them. So grateful, but yet guilty. I felt the guilt because I'm hearing people that went through so much more adversities in their lives and they've persevered. And then here goes Camille. Here goes Camille that had the, you know, has the parents. Thankfully, I've never had that form of real trauma abuse, like, like you know, those or, or illnesses. And I'm still not making it in this world. I'm still not a six figure. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still. That's what always would go through my mind is I'm still, I should be. If these people are doing it, 
they're, I, shame on me. Shame on me. I started to feel guilty. These feelings started to make me feel like as if my story, why would anybody want to hear my story? I don't have those, tra those tragedies and, 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 and what have you. I don't have any of that, those, those really, really deep in depth ones like that. For the longest time, I would stay silent because I said my story does not matter. I'm not going to tell them about what is this mental health? Who cares? Everybody has it. Why? Who am I to even say, say something? Camille, stay quiet. Your story doesn't matter. Who cares that, you know, your parents are your only child for 10 years and they went through, you know, alcoholism, fighting and uh, the stuff that I saw between them. Yes, it wasn't of, of violence, but it was a verbal violence that I saw between them. And how did it damage me? Oh, immensely. But it doesn't matter. They didn't hit me, right? So why does my story matter? Oh, Camille, you talk to everybody. You're in Canada. You have all these opportunities. Why are you, why are you, why do you even care that people are making fun of you saying that you talk too much or that you're just silly? That's not a trauma. Stay quiet. Your story doesn't matter, Camille. These were a lot of the things I used to say to myself so many times. So many times when I used to look in the mirror and someone would make a comment on my complexion and I would question myself because I look different. But how dare I even comment because thank God, thank you, I'm in a school, so I have no voice. Why should I have that voice? I should be grateful, right? I should be grateful even though I look different and my hair was pulled and I couldn't understand why I look so different and nobody liked me. That happens to everybody, Camille, so be quiet. These were the lies I continuously held on to myself. These were the stories I would say that my voice didn't matter because how dare I speak up when other people have it worse. Let them speak up. My story doesn't matter. I would go and get my cup filled and inspired by these amazing individuals that have made it through that are using their tragedy to, uh, to assist others in their lives to be triumphant. I would listen and I would be so inspired and motivated, but then that guilt would creep in. It kept on creeping in. It kept on creeping in until later on in my life. There's even more of my story too, but you know, later on in my life, I was in this, I was sitting in my silence and I was just came from a seminar. It was an amazing seminar and I, everybody was phenomenal speakers and I was so, my cup was filled. But when I got home, I sat down and I said to myself right then and there, I said to my own self, Camille, <clears throat> you will never be on stages like that because your story is nothing as big as theirs. Camille, why even bother go and do these things and say to go to these spaces and places? Your story is never going to impact anybody. But in that same stance, sit, seat, seat is when I got up and I looked in the mirror. This all happened around the same time, about three, four years ago, is when I got up from that seat after I name called myself, after being inspired, and I went to the mirror, and I went closer to the mirror, and I was like, come here, look at you. You're just aging. You're just so old. Look, you, you should be bad. You should be, you should be further. You should be further in life. You put everybody first so much that now you're just sitting here, and look at you. You are just... Nothing, Camille, you're nothing. And I would go closer. I went closer to the mirror and I started pushing up my face, finding even more imperfections in my mindset about what I saw looking back at me. And it was in that split second, I'll never forget my, 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 I, I think my daughter was seven or eight at that time, came up and said, mommy, you're so beautiful. And I stopped and I looked back at her and I said, thank you. And then she went off and did her little kid stuff. But in that moment, I went back into that mirror and I looked at it, back at myself. And I said, Camille, your biggest enemy is your inner me. Camille, your story, you may feel like as if it doesn't have any substance to it. But it's your story, which makes it unique. Camille, your story 
is meant for the people that are also feeling like you, who feel like as if their voice doesn't matter, that their stories are not as great or bad. But what do you mean as great or, bad or, or, or big? Who defines that except ourselves? But it took me name calling myself. It took the innocence of my daughter to stop from skipping and look at me just touching my face like a, like a barbarian, you know, like all over the place. To stop and look, while I'm doing that name calling myself, she says I'm beautiful. And it was in that moment I said to myself, Camille, stop this insanity. Stop holding on to the comparison. You are comparis comparing yourself and your life to others. Your story does matter. Your story is what has created you to who you are becoming. Your story is what allows you to really seek even greatness in what you're doing now because of the experiences, because of the adventures that you have went through. When I think about my story, I think about how much I love what I do because of my story, the wellness. When people think about wellness and they hear about wellness, they think it's just fitness and nutrition. But for me, wellness saved my life. Because on those times when my parents, they had me young, so when they would fight and ask me, sit me down as an only child and tell me, ask me, who do I love more? And I'd have to sit there. I love them both, but they put me on the spot. I remember going back and saying, I love them both. I love them both. I'm so bad. I'm so bad. And then I would go with my own little eight-year-old self and say, I love you, Camille. I love you, Camille. I remember back at eight years old, I was doing mirror work that I didn't even know was a thing. Wellness saved me. I knew naturally to not listen to the fights of my parents and to go upstairs and talk love into me. I love my parents. You know, kids, that's all we do. They live and strive and breathe for their parents at a certain age, you know, if they, especially if they had loving ones. That's all they live for. I love you. I'm never leaving you. Right, mom and dad? And when they went through that, I automatically did that. And that was my soother. I never realized that until I sat down and I looked at it. My story. My story does not have trauma of beating, but my story has trauma of questioning love. Love that I could have questioned right into my adulthood. And that could have blocked me from having a marriage of 23 years that I have now. A love that could have blocked me from still being a, when I went through my anxiety and when I was diagnosed with clinical depression and had the first form of anorexia, not because I didn't like about what I saw in the mirror, it had nothing to do with body image. It was because I always used to hear, Camille, shut up. You talk too much. Shut up. You talk too much. That's what I used to hear all the time on the playground. I used to hear it from teachers. Stop asking so much questions, Camille. You ask too much questions. I compartmentalized, I always say that word wrong, but I compartmentalized it so much in me that it silenced me without me even realizing it. I put a mask on as a teenager. I was the funniest person. Everybody thought I was quirky. But when I got home, I took off that mask and I'd go and sleep. I slept so much that I forgot to eat. I slept so much I forgot to eat. And it wasn't until I got, my parents got called at school because a teacher noticed how skinny I was. They noticed how lethargic I was becoming and I was starting to have panic attacks in class. This is in the 90s. So in the 90s, there was no such thing as mental health, right? You just drink some tea and you go upstairs and you're fine. There's nothing wrong. You have no bills. You have no real, real struggle, Camille. So why are you depressed? Why are you going through all of these things in these circumstances? So it wasn't until I truly went back, even when I was going through that, it was like I went back to my inner child and what I used to do to soothe myself because I was the only child for 10 years before my sister was born. The sister to my parents, I'm so grateful that they did this. They intentionally had my sister with the hopes that they would actually fall back in love again. They never really wanted a child. They just like, maybe I need a child that will work out, work out with our, our, our marriage. And that was the silliest and best, must, I mean, not even mistake, I mean, decision that my parents made because 10 years I was alone and I didn't realize until my sister was born how alone I was. And that was the best thing because when my parents used to argue, I used to take, up, take Alana upstairs and we would go and close the door and sing, um, I love you. Barney was our song. 
I never, it's amazing how much a child naturally is in tune with their inner. I understood the power of love from a child. I had it so deep in me where when they were going through their turmoil, I protected my sister and myself through love. But somewhere along adolescence and being told to shut up, be quiet, you don't matter. Or, you know, you don't look the same. Or go and stand in the corner, Camille. Ooh, you're dark skinned. Ooh, you better not get in the sun a lot. I used to hear that a lot too. I didn't realize as I was growing up through that life, how much that love I once had for myself and used to soothe me, it disappeared. It completely disappeared because of other people's words, because of society, because of the expectations I thought I should have had because everybody else around me was doing that, right? How come Camille wasn't having a boyfriend? How come I didn't feel these ways? How come I wasn't attracted to boys right away? How come I didn't, like, there must be something wrong with me. I wasn't attracted to anybody. I just wanted to be me. But I thought that I was broken because every time I'd say something, Camille would be quiet. So then that love that I used to soothe myself with as a child disappeared. And that's when that anxiety appeared. That's when the depression, that's when I started comparing myself to everybody so much that I would copy other people's behavior because I thought that's what everybody wanted from me. And I'd come home feeling like crap. I would come home feeling like crap. I was sent to doctors. They put sticky things on my head, put needles in me to check my nerves to see if there's something. There must be something wrong with Camille because she has depression. There must be something wrong with her nerves. So let's put some iodine in her ner in her veins and let's go and look at her even deeper. Oh no, 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 she looks fine. Oh, let's stick some sticky no things around her head and let's let's measure her serotonin. Oh yeah, it's low a bit, but huh, she's fine. Oh, maybe it's her doctor. All these things that they were doing without asking me, Camille, how are you? Tell me about you. Tell me about, they were, they were all, they were always trying to find some, but there's something wrong with her because she has a perfect life. So there's nothing for her to be depressed about. So it must be medical in the, in the sense of physical. And it wasn't until my ad adolescent years that I realized it was, it was when I, um, uh, it was in college and a teacher took me because I would go with my eyes and lows, but I would stay quiet. And she noticed one day that I would be loud and boasty with my friends, but she would notice me very quiet at times where nobody's no eyes were on me. So she went, huh? And she was my first discussion. Miss Brown, she would always have these discussions. Actually, it was in high school. She would always have these conversations with me. And she also became my support person in the sense of she wasn't my parent. She wasn't expecting anything from me. She just saw this loud person in public, but this quiet, shot, like not even shallow, this quiet tucked in person in a corner. Any chance I got, I would tuck myself in a corner so people wouldn't even notice. People didn't even notice. As loud as I was in a crowd, they didn't notice when I tucked in a corner and was crying or I wasn't even, or I was trying to be unseen, but she did. And she actually created one of my credits in high school to become, um, she would take me to, uh, these, these child therapists or the, to talk, to have conversations. Uh, and she actually made that into a credit. It was a social science credit. I got a high school credit for that. She's like, I'm going to change this new because the social studies classes are not, are, I was having panic attacks in them. So she got, got a way to make that my credit. And there was one time that they, uh, took me to CAMH. That is the mental health hospital here in Canada to give a tour, to talk about, to get me, get pamphlets and all stuff to understand what clinical depression is. Clinical and seasonal, seasonal, seasonal depression. Those are different levels of depression. And I remember walking around in the cam age. And I remember I was also on, I didn't even say this part, I also was on medication. I was on medication from the age of 14 to 21, Paxil. It was an antidepressant. Uh, keep in mind, let, let it be noted too, that that Paxil, the same one that I was on, was recalled two years after I, I weaned myself off of it because it was looked at as being very heavily addictive. And it was because when I was on it, at an adolescent, when my, my, my brain was still developing, they put me on this. When they put me on this high dosage, if I missed one pill, one pill, people, I would have a full-blown panic attack where I would lose my breath and they would have to come and give me oxygen. But it was, they would just they say it off as, oh, Camille, you're just panicking, it's you. But it actually ended up being those pills. And I remember when I was in that hospital and I remember the feeling of those, I did not like how those pills made me feel. They made me feel lethargic. I was like walking zombie. 
I was calmer, but I was a walking zombie. And then I was also pat, pat terrified if I missed a pill, I would go panic. And I remember when I was in that hospital and I was speaking with an individual and that was there as a, as a, as a patient. And they were saying to me that there's a lot of times that you can actually, if you, he, he was just, you know, he was talking, he's like, I wish I got to know me more before I started to really depend on my medication because he's like, I mix my medication so much that now I'm here. I'm so dependent on it because I've made my own concoctions of it that now my brain can't, doesn't know if I need it or when I don't need it. Because if I knew myself, if I ever had a chance to ever get to know myself more and love me, and when he said that, it sparked me. I was like, what do you mean love me? Love me? Who loves me? He's like, you love you. You need to love yourself. And I remember that. And I was like, huh. And it was in that moment when I had that discussion, I started, I, like I relived, I went back to that childhood of, looking in the mirror and saying, I love you, Camille, and singing the Barney songs to my sister. It was like at that instant moment. It took six years for that moment to come right back again, six, seven years. And when it did, I was like, I love me. I love me, Camille. This medication, am I against it for other people? Or for people? Absolutely not. But I knew it was doing something to me that wasn't good because my body was not feeling good. So I started to be proactive. I started to have discussions I started to go to these uh, events, I mean, to my, to the counseling and have open discussions about love and about loving me, about what I looked at in the mirror. And as I was doing that, I slowly was weaning myself off of that medication. And while I was doing that, I all of a sudden got this energy to move my body. And I realized every time I went for a walk, especially with nature, it was like I was going back to my love. I was going back to that eight-year-old child. I was going back to who I was before and understanding about the love I should have within myself, not trying to please everybody, do everything for everyone, not make my parents upset because I didn't like to see them cry. So I take care of Alana. I want Alana to never see her parents the way I saw them because my parents are awesome parents and I protect my dad. My sister has no idea of the parents that I saw, but I protected her like through hell or high water. I did. And my parents are great. And she now got the great um, end of the stick. And I am so happy for her for that. I don't hold any, I'm proud of myself that I was able to protect her and that she sees greatness in my parent and our parents all the time. Cause they, my parents are deserving of that. They just didn't get along. That's okay. That's between them. And I understand and respect that now and know it's not because of me, but I have realized that wellness is what has catapulted me to who I am continuously becoming. Because every time, between the time of 18 to now 42, I can say 18 to 38, I should say rather, <clears throat> I knew, stra or 36, I knew strategies and understood my own self because I got in tune with who I was and who I was becoming and who I am deeper. I started to, my levels of not caring about other people's opinions went down a lot faster than a lot of people in their 20s. I started to not really care as much about other people's opinions. It started being me. Yes, now all of a sudden, Camilla, I talks a lot. Yes, I do. Now I don't care if you say that I speak. Can you imagine people in my neighborhood who say I speak white? I didn't know that there was a difference of speaking white or black. I didn't know that that was a thing, but apparently it is. So now, yes, Camille is speaking in the way that she speaks with pride and with strength. I stand up and I speak up. I get those mentors. I get my cup filled. I go to those seminars. Yes, at those times, those seminars, I would get filled with hearing about how people were able to, you know, rich dad, poor dad, we triumphed. We went through so much amazingness. But something happened at 36. It's when I started questioning my own story. It's like I went up and then I went down. And that's where I realized that wellness is always a work in progress because life continuously changes. So when I got to 36 with a, my third child, so I used to be a financial advisor, a teacher. I was always, at, I was always slated as the person that's going to be the business guru of my era, area, area. And now I'm a stay-at-home mom with three kids, 36, didn't know what I was doing, uh, feeling the lowest of low. Even when I got my full-time job, the pandemic was going on and all this depression. And that's where I'm leaving you back to with that story of when I looked in the mirror and my daughter came to me. And now when I look back and why I'm telling you this story right now is that is my story and my story does matter. And it is meant to be told and shared because wellness to me 
It saved my life. Wellness for me reminded me about the love I need to always have. Even when this world around me looks like it's crumbling, I have control about how I feel about myself. When I get to sit down in my own peace and go back into that love and understand that I sometimes need to have my accountability, I need to continuously work on it. I love what I do, people, because I get the opportunity to continuously work on my wellness because I get to join everybody else on their wellness journey too. So it allows me to keep keep notes and tabs on my own self. Wellness saved my life. And if I did not take the time out to sit down and really marinate and love my story, not compare it to what I have labeled as a tragedy or what others have labeled as a tragedy or trauma. Your, everybody has their own definition of tragedies and traumas and how would they relate and resonate with them is how they do. And everybody's story needs to be told because there is that person, that person that could feel like just like me, that average quote unquote person that needed to hear this story. To know that their story matters. There could be somebody that has a tr- huge tragedy and trauma that needed to hear this story. To show that that, you know what? I know a lot of people that have went through some really crazy stuff in life. And they felt like as if they were broken. But when I've told them my story and say, oh my gosh, Camille, you? Camille, you? You outgoing person that looks like you got it. You went through that? You went through that SHIT? What? You're lying. No, you yeah, so I, you know, and as I tell the story and then they, and especially people I grew up with and then they paint back the picture when they remember, I'm like, they're like, oh my gosh, so much to the point right now that I am a godmother of one of my biggest antagonists in high school. I'm her god, I'm a godmother of her daughter. And it was because of the fact that as, as, as we came as an adult and we had the conversation and she really saw, we both realized that we were both being guided by our own traumas behind the scenes of high school and adolescence and why we treated each other that way. Did we as women now be able to come together as a tribe and connect and share the love of our diversity, of our diverse, because she has some serious trauma. Meanwhile, I always thought she had it together because she always, she always had the latest hairstyle and the, the, the best clothes, but she was masking that living in poverty. But I didn't know that. So when I was, so, so she took out her bulimia on me and then, you know, if, you know, there's all these different things, but now when we look at it and we tell our story, we're able to even teach our next generation about how the, using the power of their voice, using the power of their experience, understanding that comparison is a thief of joy. There's no such thing as comparison in this world. We are all individuals. We all have different circumstances, situations. We'll all experience what I see is blue. You may see is red. So we are all unique and we all have a story. So I did thank you all for allowing me to share this one. And I thank you. I really did talk a lot. I do. I, you know, I do. And that's another th- a trauma that I am working on. I got to stop saying I talk a lot. This is something I'm still working on. I may, I am a wellness designer and your self image cheerleader, but I'm a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. So as I go on my thing called life in this journey, I am continuously growing and glowing and going and always building to the change of who I am becoming. And that is what my story does for me. That is what I do for wellness. And this is what I know. God has brought to me, my source has said to me to use my teaching, use my story, use the beauty of wellness greater than fitness and nutrition. That is gets people in the door because, you know, that's what we're derived derived from. But when they really understand that what I do is deeper than that. That's where the tribe is. And I thank each and every one of you all who has ever trusted me in any of the rooms I do, from the 5 a.m. room to this room, to spending your time with me. And I thank you to all those that have trusted in me to also put that investment in their wellness with myself too as well, because you are also pouring into my cup and allowing me to continue to write chapters in my story. So I thank you. And with that, I would love to hear. I see my beautiful sister, Claudia, and my brother, David, here on stage. Thank you all so much again down there in the listening lounge for sticking with me through all of that. I greatly appreciate it. But Miss Claudia, would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Hello, Camille, and I'm absolutely sending my love to you. Um, 
I love your story. I love hearing you talk about, you know, just your overcoming because you are definitely a energizer bunny. And yes, you do talk a lot. And that is definitely one of the things I like about you. Um, because I notice with my friends, I'm the more quiet one. And I think Camille and I were on a video, um, sort of meet and greet a while back. And I told her, I said, Hey, you are the person that's just, uh, you know, the energy and everything. And I'm like Snoop Dogg, the laid back without the marijuana. And that's, and that's usually most of the dynamics of my friends. Um, so I do appreciate you. Um, Camille, I just have to put that out there. And if people did, you know, get on you for talking, my thing is that, you know, when you are you, you attract the people who are going to be around you, like being around you. And that is one of the things as I grew up and learn, um, in my 47 years of living is that you've got to be yourself. And I've always been the the child who went out and did her thing. I've always been that maybe because I was the youngest. Um, so I was able to get away with that. So, and I, I can't say I have any major trauma or any of those things. I cannot say that difficulties. Yes, that's, that's life. That's how it is. And so the way my story now at least shape my life or impact my life in the last couple of years, I have taken on caregiving for my parents. Um, one's 90, the other is 84. And it wasn't intended to be uh, the level at it, it is right now, which is completely involved. So how that shaped my life is I cannot do a full-time job because they are a full-time job. And it's just having me rework my next step. And I think this last year or so, it's actually changing the trajectory of my life to move into where I want to be. And I've started doing that. I I went back to writing. I've always loved writing since I was a kid. It's just one of those things. And I've moved back into that at this point. And I'm starting to meld that with my mental health uh, over 15 years of working in mental health. And it's funny when you said that story, Camille, about... um, sitting down with your parents and telling them, Hey, you guys just need to separate, separate. I actually had a patient. Um, I forgot. She probably was eight years old, smart, absolutely wonderful little girl back when I used to work with kids. And she actually sat down and she said to me, she said, I was happy. I was so happy when my parents divorced because when they were together, they were the worst. And when they separated, they were so much happier and she was also happier. So your story actually reminded me of that little girl because I never heard that from anybody, her precociousness, her insight, and the fact that she wanted her parents to separate because it was just causing her life, um, distress was an interesting view and it that definitely impacted me on how I work with kids or even 